After a plane crash, a couple is trapped on a tiny uninhabited island in the middle of the ocean, and they soon have to learn the shocking truth about it. A couple in love, Sarah and Jackson, are sitting in a bar watching videos together. They met on the tropical island of Mauritius and have spent an adventure-filled year together. Tonight is their last night together, in the morning, the girl flies to London to start her new job. She offers Jackson to go with her, but he decides to stay on the island where he was so happy. An awkward pause ensues, and the boy offers Sarah another bottle of beer. When he leaves briefly, Sarah decides to run away, as she hates saying goodbye. Jackson returns, confused, trying to look for his beloved. A year later, fate brings Sarah back to Mauritius again, where her best friend's wedding will be held. Away from work, the girl feels free again. She arrives at an old acquaintance's house, Solomon, on behalf of the bride, but at first glance there seems to be no one inside. Sarah climbs over the fence and is immediately attacked by an angry dog. The girl climbs back up the fence in fear, but fortunately for her, the owner of the house steps outside. His assistants load crates of rum into the girl's pickup truck for the upcoming celebration. It's the good stuff. It's like rocket fuel. Later, Sarah meets up with Pascal and other old friends, and they party together like they did a year ago. The best friends decide to have a cocktail at the bar owned by Pascal. The bride says the celebration will take place on the nearby island of Rodriguez, where a ferry is scheduled to take them early in the morning. Sarah confesses that she has missed Mauritius and memories of it always make her smile. Pascal asks if her friend wants to stay here this time, because her position allows her to work remotely. The girl says she is needed in London, but there is a hint of doubt in her voice. A boat approaches the pier, from which Jackson emerges in the company of his friends. Pascal announces that he has opened his own diving school on the island and that he has a girlfriend. Sarah is embarrassed to learn that she will have to meet her ex-partner before the wedding, as he will appear at a beach party planned for the evening. During the party, the girl can't take her eyes off Jackson. Finally, having worked up the courage, she decides to approach him first, which irritates his new girlfriend. Sarah tries to start a friendly conversation with her ex but gets indifferent answers. He decides to leave the party, but the girl does not give up and offers to walk him home. During the walk, Sarah manages to soften Jackson up, and they go drinking together to his house. The girl openly flirts with the guy and flirtatiously puts on her life jacket. Jackson, fooling around, places it right on top of her. So, the pair find themselves very close to each other and feelings flare up again between them. Sarah hopes for a kiss, but Jackson manages to resist the temptation. He sincerely tells her that he does not want her to betray him again. After this, they begin to quarrel, recalling all of each other's mistakes and resentments. I'm sorry I wanted more than this. I wasn't content to just float around in a perpetual gap year. During the heated argument, they get closer and merge in a passionate kiss. In the morning, after a stormy night, Sarah decides to run off again without saying a word. Enraged, Pascal calls her and informs her that she has missed the only ferry that will take her to the wedding venue. Finding herself in a desperate situation, Sarah arrives at her elderly friend Freddie's house. He is going to fly to the celebration in his small plane and agrees to take the girl with him. The girl is very surprised when she learns that Jackson has also agreed to fly with Freddie to the wedding. After grabbing a case of rum, the trio loads onto the plane. Sarah awkwardly tries to talk to Jackson, but after that morning's events, he chooses to ignore her. During the flight, Freddie invites Sarah to take the co-pilot's seat while Jackson sleeps. They strike up a conversation about relationships and the man talks about his wife, who recently passed away after a serious illness. He tells the girl that love isn't always easy, alluding to her and Jackson. Sarah used to take pilot lessons from Freddie, so he suggests she take the wheel. He reminds her of the basic safety rules. Make sure that the altimeter stays below 20,000 feet, because you know what happens at 20,000 feet. Yes, altitude sickness. After receiving her final instructions, Sarah shuts off the autopilot and prepares to take control of the plane. Jackson wakes up, noticing that a poorly secured gas cylinder has rolled under his feet. Suddenly Freddy starts coughing convulsively, gasping for air. Jackson tries to secure the cylinder in place when suddenly he hears Sarah screaming desperately that the old man is having a heart attack. The pills don't help, and the next second the chief pilot collapses headfirst onto the steering wheel, sending the plane into free fall. The cylinder comes off again, making a crack in the windshield of the plane. Jackson barely manages to reach Freddy and pull him off the wheel. In the last moment before crashing into the sea, Sarah manages to straighten the plane and gain altitude. Jackson drags Freddy's body away and tries to give him CPR. 
but precious rescue time is lost and the guy tearfully covers his breathless body with his jacket. After he takes the chief pilot's seat, it turns out that the plane's GPS is broken and there is no cell phone connectivity on the couple's phones, so now they don't know where they are. Jackson, along with Sarah, tries to communicate with the outside world through the radio. We don't even know which direction we're going in. We have no idea where we are. We could really use some help, so please, please, please. No one makes contact, which causes even more panic for the couple. Their only hope is the autopilot, which is supposed to take them to Rodriguez Island. However, it soon becomes clear that the broken cylinder has damaged important instruments in the control system, including the autopilot. The situation is complicated by the fact that there is only half a tank of fuel left. So we have no pilot, no autopilot, no GPS. Neither of us can land a plane. Sarah, who has been taught some piloting basics by Freddy, must get the plane to safety. After calculating an approximate route using a compass, the girl turns the plane 180 degrees. The couple is startled to see a storm moving toward them. The plane begins to shake, but Jackson is confident that they will make it through the storm cloud in time. They finally manage to contact Samuel, the local air traffic controller. The couple reports back to him and asks for help. The air traffic controller says they need to change direction immediately or they will use up all their fuel for the trip. In order to get to land as quickly as possible, they need to fly west, right through the storm. Jackson is not happy about this prospect and asks if they can land the plane on the water instead. Do not attempt to land on the water. You will crash and sink. We have no way of locating you. As the storm approaches, communications are cut off. The couple has no choice but to fly into the heart of the storm. Lightning flashes ahead and dark clouds envelop them. Jackson tells Sarah to move to the main pilot's seat so she can see the instruments clearly. The girl has a difficult task, despite the inclement weather, she must make sure that the plane stays at the same altitude. Lightning strikes make the aircraft shake violently and the instruments go crazy. Terrified of crashing, Sarah decides to gain altitude to fly over the storm. In a panic, Jackson tries to dissuade the girl from the crazy idea, but she doesn't listen to him. Finally, they find themselves above the storm cloud, rejoicing at the clear skies. But the euphoria quickly ends, just as Freddy warned, they get altitude sickness. Oh, the dials are sort of moving. I'm fine. While the girl is unconscious, the plane starts flying downhill rapidly. Jackson manages to bring her to her senses, but Sarah can't stop the fall. By some incredible twist of fate, they manage to survive and level out the flying machine. However, during the fall, their compass got busted, causing them to go permanently off course. Jackson remembers how to make a compass out of improvised means. He takes a magnetized needle and releases it into a liquid with alcohol. This is how they manage to pinpoint their location and Sarah turns west again. Finally, the couple manages to make it out of the storm, but they have expended far too much fuel to do so. Sarah notices that one of the tanks is almost completely empty and decides to switch to another, full tank. However, the fuel level begins to drop precipitously and does not recover at all, even over time. There's gotta be a leak somewhere. Jackson suggests that the fuel tank may have been damaged during the storm, causing it to malfunction. In his persistent desire to find and repair the cause of the failure, he decides to climb out. All the while, Sarah tries to convince him to give up the idea, but realizes that without fuel, they have no chance of survival. Jackson secures himself with a rope and asks the girl to slow down. He cautiously crawls out of the plane and, after several unsuccessful attempts, reaches the engine compartment. There he discovers the breach and tapes it up. But the next moment, he accidentally slips and falls, injuring his arm. Jackson manages to grab onto the rung with his healthy arm, and the girl, securing the wheel in one position, rushes to the guy's aid. His safety rope gets stuck in the wheel of the plane. Sarah cuts the rope and gives him a hand to help him get to the cockpit. One, two, three. Through a titanic effort, the girl manages to get Jackson inside. She examines his arm and uneasily discovers that he has a serious fracture. After treating the open wound with alcohol, she diverts the guy's attention and straightens his arm. Then, with the aid of the first aid kit, the girl puts a tourniquet on it. After recovering from the stress, the couple returns to the dashboard and realizes that there is only 5% fuel left in the tank. Sarah suggests dropping weight to buy some time and save fuel. At first, Sarah throws out all the seats and luggage, which attracts the attention of a boat cruising below. Soon the couple realizes that this is not enough, and they look toward Freddy's breathless body together. The girl decides to take desperate measures. She tears off the family photo of the happy Freddy from the dashboard and slips it into the man's breast pocket. 
moving the old man's body toward the exit, Sarah tearfully pushes him down. Next, the girl sets out to dispose of the liquor crates, but suddenly Jackson is struck by the idea of using rum as fuel. It's Solomon's rocket fuel, right? It's ethanol! I mean, couldn't it be used as plane fuel? Because of his serious injury, the guy can't refuel the tanks, so Sarah decides to carry out the mission. Gathering courage, she goes outside and climbs onto the roof of the plane. Once she gets to the wing, she opens the fuel tank and begins pouring in the alcohol that Jackson hands her. After emptying all the rum bottles, Sarah tries to get back up and miraculously avoids falling down. The risk proves to be worth it, and the fuel level increases slightly. Jackson informs the girl that he spotted a small island along the way where they can try to land. He tells Sarah that they need to go right back, as there may be no other chance for rescue. The girl decides to listen to the guy and takes the main pilot's seat. The couple notifies the dispatcher of their intentions, hoping he can hear them. Sarah turns the plane back around, but after a few minutes of flight, they are still unable to locate the island. Then the scariest thing happens, the fuel supply runs out completely and the plane's engine stops working. The flying machine begins to glide through the air and flies like that for some time. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Sarah decides to apologize to her former partner for all the pain her actions have caused him. Jackson also apologizes for being selfish and not appreciating his lover's choices. Why do you hate saying goodbye so much? Honestly, I think I'm terrified because you make me want to stay. Suddenly Jackson notices in the window the very tiny island. The happy girl turns the plane around and begins to glide towards land. She tries to land, but at low altitude she completely loses control of the aircraft. Jackson desperately tries to shout to the dispatcher to report an emergency landing. Despite Sarah's best efforts, the plane falls into the water and flips over. Water instantly begins to fill the fuselage while the couple remains trapped inside. Sarah manages to open the door and swim to the surface, but she realizes that Jackson is nowhere near her. She dives back for the guy and discovers that he is unconscious and stuck in the wing of the sunken plane. The girl pulls a life jacket out of the cockpit and puts it around the guy's neck before the plane goes to the bottom of the ocean. They both float to the surface and Sarah pulls the guy's body to dry land. She gives him CPR and Jackson regains consciousness, spitting out seawater. The exhausted couple falls to the sand, glad to be rescued. They doze off for a while, and when they come to, they find that the land around them is almost completely submerged. It's just a sandbar. It'll disappear with the tide. Sarah is hysterical, realizing that their chances of survival are reduced to zero. She looks around desperately, trying to find rescue, but only the vast sea surrounds them. Gradually, the ground begins to fall from under the couple's feet. Sarah begins to cry, deciding that this is where her life will be cut short. Exhausted and drained, Jackson realizes that he definitely has no chance of survival, so he offers his beloved to wear his life jacket. But Sarah refuses and says that they are a team and she will stay with him until the end. Jackson's wound opens up, which attracts the attention of some sharks. The pair confess their love to each other, sensing that their end is near. At that moment, however, a small fishing boat approaches them, having heard their rescue signals. Sarah pulls Jackson to the boat with the last of her strength. They successfully climb aboard before the sharks catch up with them. The surviving couple promise never to say goodbye again and kiss each other. Do you think the main characters could have survived such a situation without each other's help? Share your opinion in the comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.